Our scripture reading today is Luke chapter 9, beginning in verse 57 through verse 62. As they were walking along the road, a man said to him, I will follow you wherever you go. Jesus replied, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has no place to lay his head. He said to another man, Follow me. But the man replied, Lord, first let me go and bury my father. Jesus said to him, Let the dead bury their own dead, but you go and proclaim the kingdom of God. Still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Jesus replied, No one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for the service in the kingdom of God. And all God's people said, Amen. I don't know if you've heard, uh, but there's a new church that's opening up. And this new church is designed to bring people back to church. The people who have been turned off by church and really haven't been coming at all, this church is new and designed just for them. Now the first thing that you'll notice about this church that's odd is it's open 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. You see, they've done that because they want the church to be open when you want to come to church. All right, 11 o'clock on Sunday might not fit your schedule. Maybe you've got some sort of sport, so you want to go to the football game, or you want to go out on the lake, or, or whatever. Maybe you just want to sleep in. All right, you can come to church anytime you want. Late at night, early in the morning, any day during the week, doesn't matter. Now, you might ask, well, how do they do this? Is the pastor like on call or something? Well, this is really where technology comes in. When you come into the church, you're handed an iPad. And that iPad has all of the order of service on it. So the first thing you do is you choose the sermon. And you can choose the sermon by the topic, by the scripture reading. You can choose the sermon by the length. Whatever it is, you can pick and choose the sermon. You can even pick the voice of the pastor who is giving the sermon. Because it's a menu. You choose what you want to hear. Now, along those same lines is the music. You can choose the music you want to hear. You can have traditional hymns. You can have rock and roll church. You can have Gregorian chant if you want. It's all there on the menu. It's like going to McDonald's, right? The burgers are the sermon. The drink is the music. And then you've got your sides as well. You can pick to have certain prayers, the Lord's Prayer, creeds, whatever it is that you want, <clears throat> responses. It's all there for you. You just pick and choose. And you create your own order of service. Now, the next question you might ask is, well, gee, David, that's pretty interesting. But how does that all work? Because if I come into the church at 2 o'clock in the morning because that's what fits my schedule, and I go ahead and I pick all the selections that I want on the menu, what about the church itself? Well, this is where technology really comes into place. Along with your iPad are virtual reality glasses. When you come into the building, it's more of just a construct. And you can pick and choose what the building looks like utilizing the virtual reality glasses. You can pick the style. It can be a traditional church like we have with stained glass windows and an altar and so forth. It can be a more contemporary church where there's no cross and it's just you know, a black stage and it looks like a movie theater sort of thing. Whatever it is that you want, you can design, heck, you can pick the color of the walls of the church if you don't like the colors. It's all about you. It's all about what will make your worship experience tailored to your own desires. Along with that, you can have people, virtual people, sitting in the pews next to you. You can make it a full church, a big church, a small church, whatever. There's no end to what this virtual reality can do. Now, the next thing you might say is, well, gee, David, what if I don't even want to go physically there? Well, that's where technology continues. 
there's a smartphone app for this church. You don't have to actually go to the physical building. You can be sitting on the beach or you can be at home in bed or wherever you want to be and you just go to the smartphone app and you pull it up and you plug it in and you have the whole thing right there. Now, of course, there's one more thing. For those of you who like to go to church, maybe you have that guilt like I've got to go to church. But you don't want to spend the time there. right? You just want to drive through. Well, we got the drive through also. So you come along the side of the church building. You go through the little drive through booth. There's a camera that records you came through. You have a window sticker. You get credit for driving through church. But you don't really have to spend any time there. But you still get credit for having stopped by. Now, of course, as I tell you this story, this is all just make-believe. Right? I'm making this up to try to build a point. There's no commitment in any of the people of this story. There's no commitment to Christ at all. Everything's about me. I'm going to go and do it my way. And there's no commitment to the church, which is the body of Christ. And this is a problem. Now, it may sound far-fetched, but I can tell you, when I came here two and a half years ago, and I was sitting with uh, the editor of Cornelius Today, going through an interview process with him, and he showed me an article about a local church that was doing drive through ashes for Ash Wednesday. And he said, don't you think that's pretty innovative? And I just kind of smirked and made a face. He said, what's the matter? I said, if the ashes on Ash Wednesday aren't important enough for you to get out of the car and go into the building, then how important is it really? I mean... I think we have just dumbed down the church experience when we start to do these sorts of things. And so I want to ask, whatever happened to the commitment to Christ and His church? In the following of Christ, there is no place for impulsiveness, no place for procrastination, no place for second thoughts. And the people in the reading today characterize those aspects of our humanity. We must make sure that we are all in for Christ. Because as the Lord says, if we are characterized by these types of actions, then we are not fit for the service in the kingdom of God. So let's take a moment and look at this passage and see exactly what I'm talking about. Now there are three people, three men in this passage. The first one I'm going to say is characterized by impulsiveness. This man comes up to Jesus and says he wants to follow him. Now we don't know what the man's motivation is. This is certainly different than the others. Jesus is normally calling people to follow him. This guy says, hey, Jesus, I'm going to follow you. Now based on the context, I think this man is looking to follow Jesus because he's looking to seek glory with Christ. You know, many people are beginning to believe that Jesus is the Christ. He is now resolutely on his way to Jerusalem. Jesus is charismatic. He's performing miracles. And if this man thinks of the Christ as the people did in first century Israel, they're looking for the Messiah to come back in power and glory, to overthrow the Romans, to reestablish the greatness of the nation of Israel. The Messiah would take the throne of his father David and rule on high over the nation. If that's the case, then hey, I want a part of that. I'm going to ride the coattails of Jesus. I'm going to offer to follow him wherever he goes because he's going on to glory and I want a part of that. And I think that's what's going on with this man. Jesus, knowing his heart, responds to the man's motivation. He says, foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests but the Son of Man has no place to lay His head. In other words, there is no earthly glory in following Me. The things that you think you're going to get, you will not get if you follow Me. 
This man reminds me of the seed that fell among rocks. If you recall from the parable of the sower, the seed that fell upon rocks springs up with joy at first of hearing the message. Seems alive and full as a follower of Christ, but has no root. And when the time of persecution comes, that follower dies off, just like the plant, because it has no root, no moisture. And so this is the first gut check for us in our attitude toward Christ. Are we following Him impulsively? Or are we following Him in sincerity? Are we looking for Jesus when things are easy? Are we going to jump out when times get tough? Remember a few weeks ago when I talked about denying yourself and taking up your cross and following Jesus? The life of a follower of Christ is not filled with earthly glory. You deny yourself, you die to yourself, and you take on the image of Christ, leaving your own self behind. That's not what this man was looking for in his impulsiveness. Let's go on to the next person. This man, I would say, is the procrastinator. Jesus now calls this second man, but the second man is not ready to go. He says, let me bury my father. Now, we're not sure if the father is dead or not. Commentators argue this. He probably is. But what you may not be familiar with is first century Jewish burial tradition. You see, what would happen is when someone died, they would bury the body in the tomb. They'd wrap it in linens and spices like like they did with Jesus when they buried him in the tomb. But with the bodies, they would decay over time. A year later, all that is left are the bones. And the family would reopen the tomb, take those bones out, and put them into a bone box, an ostuary. And then that ostuary would be placed into the family tomb. So what this man is saying is, not only do I want to bury my father, but I need to wait the year so I can go back and do the second burial, as it's called. He's procrastinating the call of Christ. He's putting it off for something else. Now the problem with procrastination is you never get anything done, right? You know, there was going to be the meeting of the procrastinators club, but they all kept putting it off. So we need to ask ourselves, what is our procrastination issue? I will follow Christ when my kids graduate from school. Or I will follow Christ when my health is better. Or I'll I'll, I'll follow Christ when I finish school. Or maybe I'll follow Christ when this project at work is done. Or I'll follow Christ when I retire. We find many ways to procrastinate following and serving Christ. And in the second part, we need to ask ourselves, What excuse are we using for putting off our commitment to Christ? Finally, we come to the last person. Beginning in verse 61, still another said, I will follow you, Lord, but first let me go back and say goodbye to my family. Now this person says, I want to follow you, Jesus, but he's already got an excuse in his mind why he can't go do it. There's a but at the end. Let me follow you, Jesus, but I need to go say goodbye to my family. Now, what strikes me is if I knew I was going to go to ask Jesus to follow him, of course I would hope Jesus would say yes, and then I would immediately follow him. I would drop everything and go. If I had that plan to ask, wouldn't I have said goodbye to my family already? Hey, I'm going off to follow Jesus. I love you. I'm gone. And then go follow Jesus. Jesus uses the metaphor of the plow with this man. And he says, no one who puts his hand to the plow and looks back is fit for service in the kingdom of God. Now to understand what he's saying, you have to understand plowing techniques, particularly ancient plowing techniques. So if you have a plow, you've got two hands on the handles, you've got a beast of burden, probably an ox, who pulls that plow, and you're guiding it from behind, right? You're steering it. Now if you want to plow a straight line, 
You need to look off into the horizon and focus on a point out there in the horizon. And as you continue to focus on that point on the horizon, you will go in a straight line. What happens is if you take your hand off the plow, as Jesus says, and look back, you're going to twist or turn your plow line because you've taken your focus off the point. Same thing happens when you're driving your car. All right, I've got a bunch of kids. The kids are in the back seat. They're fighting or arguing. If I take a hand off the wheel and turn my head to tell the kids, be good, stop fighting, I'm likely to go off into another lane 